Well, all, all of ours, hopefully. Right. Um, no, but yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll dive right in. Um, first off, just an intro. My name's Josh Hare. I'm the founder of a small little brewery over in East Austin. Um, last year, we made about 20,000 gallons worth of beer. So um, small in the, in the grand scheme of things, but uh, it's a lot of volume of beer. Uh, it's called Hops and Grain Brewing. If you haven't been there, you should definitely come by. Um, we're open seven days a week. This will be the end of my, my uh, shameless plug for, uh, for visiting our tasting room. Oh, but yeah, great. come over, drink some beer, uh, talk about the day, bring friends. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, so what I'm going to dive into, um, first off, is just a story. A story that I tell uh, every new employee that we hire, uh, every beer dinner that we host, I generally start with a story. Uh, it, it, it's very near and dear to me. It speaks a lot to my own personality. But way beyond that, it's kind of a guiding principle that I operate uh, our business. Uh, we're five years old, so we've kind of uh, we've made it past that initial phase of, holy crap, uh, is this actually going to work? Um, well, we, we're crossing. We're <laughs> we're on the other side. We're 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 yeah on the, on the downhill slope of the other side. But um, the beauty in beer is that it, it never ends. Uh, it's it's something that's been around forever. Uh, it will always be around, uh, and what we do with beer is the fun piece. The product itself is, is super simple. Uh, so my story, All right, you've got a, a young man, just graduated from college. Uh, he's lost, he's confused, he's got a world of student debt uh, on his shoulders, uh, and the world in front of him, but he has no idea what he's going to do. This is autobiographical. Um, <laughs> almost. Um, and so he, he sets out one summer, right? He graduated in May. He says, I'm going to spend the next three months and I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure out my purpose, where I need to be, and what I need to be doing, right? As a 22 year old, we all find those answers just yeah. like that, right? They're super easy. Um, and so he goes on this, uh, we'll call it a road trip, right? A journey of self discovery. Absolutely, yeah. yes, he yes. He never knew what the end is, but he knew the journey was what he was seeking. Oh, indeed, absolutely, wow. absolutely. Um, and so, you know, t two weeks into his journey, he runs across uh, what he views to be this, this really wise old man. Um, had he called the, the gentleman an old man, it probably would have ended that relationship. But he saw him and he, he thought, like, wow, what a, what a wise human being. Like, I need, I need to learn from this, uh, from this guy. Um, and so he views him somewhat like a, a, a shaman, right? His, it's his guider. It's his leader. Um, and he tells him, like, you seem to have everything together. Uh, I want you to teach me. How do, I, how, do I, how do I have everything together? How do I find the answer? How do I, I do this? And the, the shaman slash, you know, uh, middle-aged man tells him, well, you need to go out and actually, like, search for a purpose. Uh, we get caught up in this idea of, like, what am I supposed to do? But none of us know what we want to do first. We just look for what's everybody else doing? How do I fit into that? People are starting up companies. My friends are going to work for investment firms. That's what I should be doing, right? Well, no, let's, let's figure out what you need. So go on this, this trek. Uh, he lays out some kind of some guidance for him, like you need to go X, Y, and Z, talk to these people, figure out what's going on. And so he goes on this journey. Uh, he encounters all kinds of struggles, right? He has no money, one. Uh, so he's trying to find ways to get gasoline to go to the next place. And he, he goes and finds a concert, and he listens to the music, and he's inspired. And then he's just like, well, shit, I just spent a lot more money. Um, I'm losing more and more money. So what do I do? So he goes on this, this long, long trek across the US. Uh, and he's on his way back. Um, and he, he heads back to this town where he met this shaman who he's, you know, he's just lost. He's got nothing. He didn't do anything. He failed at his self-discovery. And so he thinks, well, I'm going to go back, tail between my legs, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find my shaman, and I'm going to just lay it out there. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to say, you know, what, what, what did I do? Why didn't I find this? And so he comes back into the town, and he sees the shaman in this park, city park, right? It's across a creek, and he's just sitting there, uh, and he's meditating, just peaceful, quiet. Um, and so the, the, the young man yells. Uh, yells his name and finally gets his attention, you know, and, the, and so the, the, the shaman, as we'll call him, looks over and, he, you know, kind of acts like he doesn't know what's going on. And, and the student, <laughs> he's got a pint of beer next to him. Uh, the, no, the student yells to him, but he's like, I, I've been searching and I haven't found it. Um, and so the shaman just kind of shakes his head and watches and he's just like, so what, what, what is the answer? Uh, and the shaman is like, oh, well, I mean, 
the answer's on the other side, obviously. And so the, the kid looks at him and he's like, well, well, wait, well, no, well, wait, how do I get to the other side? And, and that's when the, the shaman locks eyes and he looks at him and he says, you're already there. So, guiding principle, that nonsense uh, uh, story to a lot of people, to me, is kind of the Zen guidance of, of what all of us should view as entrepreneurs, right? We're living in the present. Um, we talk about metrics, we talk about projections, we talk about forecasting, um, but we very rarely think about the now. Um, and forecasts are great, and projections are great, and a roadmap is great, and a goal is great, but if you can't make it happen now, you're never going to get to that path. Um, and so that's a, a way when I decided uh, I, I left the world of specialty retail, um, I was working in the running industry, so I, uh, I dealt in supply chain management, so I worked with major factories from Nike, Asics, Brooks, uh, Saucony, all of the major uh, running specialty apparel companies overseas, and I worked with, uh, at the time, a company called Boulder Running Company. So I was uh, the one that sourced all of the apparel, all the shoes, uh, all the gear for their shops uh, in the state of Colorado. Um, I moved down to Austin uh, to pursue uh, kind of a, a, a new place in that segment. I had met a couple of people who had been training folks for marathons, 5Ks, 10Ks. So you join this group, uh, you're part of a 25 to 30 person group, you have a coach, you have all of your workouts provided to you. It's this really great way if you want to run a marathon for the first time, here is the fully supported plan for this. Um, at the time, so this was back in 2005 here in Austin, uh, Runtex, I don't know if you remember Runtex, but Runtex was the only retail shop uh, in the city of Austin. Uh, when I was here, I was used to uh, Boulder, Colorado, which there were five running stores in a town of 90,000 people. Um, it was competition for customer service. Who had the best shoes? Who had the best customer service? Who provided that customer service in the most inviting atmosphere? And then I moved here, and there's one who virtually had a monopoly on the running specialty industry. And so I found this great group of people who trained. At the time, uh, there were 3,500 runners that trained with uh, the company called Rogue Running. Um, they now have their own retail store, which was the component that I brought. But we looked at it and said, wow, there's all these people that have to buy shoes, they have to buy shorts, they have to buy socks, they have to buy all this stuff, and they're currently buying it from a store that's the only one of its kind in a city of three quarters of a million people at the time. And so I pitched this concept of, why don't we open our own store and marry the two together? Right, so looking at just what we had in the present was we had almost 3,500 people who needed to wear stuff to run, to finish their marathons, to do their races, to get their nutrition. Uh, and so finally, after a lot of uh, pushing and prodding and pitching, uh, I convinced them to, to go down this path. And so we opened a running store. It's now eight years old. Um, it's now one of, I think, five uh, running specialty shops here in the city of Austin. Uh, but at the time, it was a brand new thing, marrying training with retail. Um, and you're starting to see this now in every Gold's Gym, every 24-hour fitness. They all have a retail component that has their logo all over it, that has, it, you have this captive audience. Why not sell them stuff that has your logo on it, right? They're, they're going to pay you for, for advertising your brand, right? Um, and so a lot of that, in, in my opinion, was really rooted in that living in the present. What do we do with the present, right? Um, so fast forward a few years. Um, I had helped grow the shop. I'd helped build it up. Uh, I was the operations manager and did all the, the raw material, what I call raw material sourcing, which was the supply chain management of shoes from overseas all the way to our stores. Um, you see shoes on a store shelf. Those shoes we look at a year and a half before they're actually available. Uh, and so we have to place orders based on what we think our sales are going to be a year and a half down the road based on new technology, based on new fabrics, um, all of those different things. So it's a really complicated matrix of trying to provide the greatest thing for your customer while also mitigating the risk of having too much inventory because you can't just put that stuff on a boat and send it back to a factory in China. Um, and so that was a, a lot of fun for me. But through that process, we decided that, you know, we've got this community of runners. They love running. They love training. And they love hanging out at our retail store because they just finished their run. What's drawing all of them away 
is they're going down to have a beer, or they're going down to have a glass of wine, or they're leaving to go to the near, you know, nearest neighborhood bar. Um, so I started reaching out to breweries, distributors. Who wants to sponsor this captive audience of thousands of people that love to drink? They're wildly brand loyal, right? So if you've, if you've ever run a long distance race before, the first time you do it, the pair of shoes that you had on, if it was a success, you will wear that pair of shoes until the day you die. Because I wore the Asics Kayano in my first marathon and they worked, and so I'm gonna buy this shoe. I don't care if things change, I don't care if it looks different, I, whatever. This thing worked for me. Absolutely, the right. It's, it's the name association. And that is something that, so craft beer, um, you can kind of define it however you want, but we are the small producers that manufacture right now 11% of the beer that's purchased in the United States. Um, we don't have a loyal fan base. We have a bunch of wildly promiscuous consumers that are trying to buy the newest thing or the thing that they've never seen before or the flashiest label or any of that stuff. We don't have the Miller Lite drinker who feels like he's cheating on his spouse if he buys Bud Light. Um, but in running, we had that captive audience. And so going out and trying to find breweries to sponsor us, no one would do anything. Um, in 2005, there were also just two breweries in the, the city. So we didn't have a whole lot of options. Uh, Shiner was technically the local brand in Austin, even though they're 100 miles away. Um, Real Ale was the Austin brand, even though they're 40 miles away. Uh, Live Oak is really the only one that is actually still here that was here at that time. Uh, and now there's 28 of us licensed uh, in the city, which is awesome. Um, but my approach came from the running side, and it came from that looking at where we were in the present. And we had a bunch of people that were wildly brand loyal, and no one would provide us with a partnership, a beer partnership. Michelob Ultra was the only brand that contributed product to, and this was back when they were sponsoring Lance Armstrong and there was this huge push for fitness and that obviously fizzled. I won't get into the, to the, the nuts and bolts of that. But, um, but from there, I, I, the, that classic uh, entrepreneurial mindset of you view a problem and you want to come up with solutions to everything. Um, whether you have started a company or not, you can't get that bug out of your head. You're constantly looking at everything as a problem. How can I solve this? And if I figure out a solution, is this something that I can actually make money off of? Uh, and that ultimately, in my opinion, is kind of what defines the direction you go. Uh, my wife tells me nonstop that I'm unemployable at this point. If the brewery doesn't work out, um, no one's hiring me um, because of that mindset. But I also think uh, more companies need to look for that mindset to hire because those are the greatest employees that you'll ever find. Um, and so. That led me down the path of searching around, why, why are there not breweries that want to be a part of this? One, why are there only two breweries in the city of Austin? Two, and three, seriously? I left Boulder and there were eight different running shops within 10 mile radi radius of us. There were 20 breweries and 90,000 people. And I moved here and there was one running shop and two breweries and three quarters of a million people. But culturally, you have the food scene, you have the music scene, you have very, very high levels of disposable income, very educated demographic, very young, lots of students. And what is it now, like seven or eight percent of UT graduates never leave? May even be higher than that. Uh, but people want to be in Austin. People want a piece of Austin. They want to stay here. So my big question was, there's no breweries here. There, there has to be a reason. Or I've just struck gold uh, and I'm about to launch into something that you know, no one has even thought of. Uh, it was a little bit of both. Um, our state regulatory agency is wildly prohibitive for breweries to operate. Um, so there's a lot of, that was the, the initial reason why people didn't want to start here. Yeah, because you, I mean, the, the, our industry is divided into what we call three tiers, the three tier system. So prohibition initially was there, the whole idea behind it was to prevent what they called tide houses. So the bar on the corner is owned by the brewery that supplies all their taps with their beer, which is also owned by the distributor, which delivers that beer between point A and point B, and it's all the same ownership. Um, at the time, too, there were brothels on the top floors. It was just a whole myriad thing of, uh, of tight houses going on. But that was what prohibition was there. It wasn't just about keeping people from drinking. Uh, it was also there to prevent what was kind of viewed as a monopoly uh, on the alcohol industry. Um, so post-prohibition, uh, the federal government said, we're going to hand over to each state 
the ability to regulate the alcohol industry. So each state gets to say, here's how we're going to do this. Well, in Texas, being the Texans that we were, we went to the richest of the three uh, pieces of that industry, which is the wholesalers, and we said, hey, can you help us write our alcoholic beverage code and write the rules for us? So fast forward quite a few years, uh, and we're still existing in a place where all of the regulations from the Alcoholic Beverage Committee benefit the middle tier. Uh, they're protecting themselves as the middleman, which I can't fault them. Uh, they have really powerful lobbyists and a lot of money to spend, which most of us do not have. Um, but that's why there were not a lot of breweries in the state of Texas at the time. Uh, so I blindly thought, that's nonsense. I mean, it uh, can't be that hard to navigate. So I gave up my job, uh, which was pretty, pretty sound at the time. Uh, being a 25-year-old, I had a great job, had a lot of great experience. I got to travel. Um, but I thought there has to be an easier way for this whole beer industry thing to work here in the state of Texas. Um, so from there, I'm going to dive into a couple of, a couple of stories. I'm a storyteller. Um, I, I, I will apologize for myself in advance, but uh, it's what I, what I enjoy the most. Um, before I got into running specialty, right out of college, I was a seventh grade science teacher for one year. One, one glorious year um, in Round Rock ISD. I taught at Grisham Middle School. Uh, which is kind of right in our neighborhood here, just a little bit north. You were uh, a Grisham Grizzly. I was a Grizzly, absolutely. Stony Point. For one, Stony Point. There you are, right there, yeah, right, right, right in the hood. Um, and so as a teacher, right, you graduate from college. I, the only reason why I pursued education is because I really thought I was going to change the world, and I was going to change it one seventh grade science student at a time. I was going to teach critical thinking skills. I was going to really challenge them to learn how to think for themselves and how to view the world as a laboratory and figure out how all of it works, you know, because that's, in my opinion, that's what makes us great as humans. It's what makes our country great. It's what makes just every bit of what we do is, is great because we get to explore how things work. And so that was my big mission. I was going to go into to education and I was just going to change the whole system, right? Well, turns out that's not a, a, a real reality uh, with the Texas public education system, at least. Um, but my first year, I, uh, I met my, my principal. Um, she was awesome, very, very helpful, uh, kind of coached me through, you know, here's how this whole onboarding thing works, here's what's going on, here's really what, you know, what you want to embrace. Um, and then she just very, like, kind of... Uh, under her breath was just like, oh yeah, and you also have to teach sex ed. It's like, oh, <laughs> so this you're not prepared for uh, as a 22 year old college graduate teaching a seventh grade science classroom. Um, and so I didn't really have a choice, right? I'd taken this job um, and it's not like, so I, I'm 35 years old, I was born in 1980. Um, when I went through sex ed in middle school, the coach, the male coach taught the boys and the female coach taught the girls, right? And that was how your class was divided. Doesn't happen that way anymore. Um, now, at least in most, most schools that have any wherewithal, uh, all of the students are together, right? Um, which I think is great. I think one, it limits a little bit of the question <laughs> likelihood for people to ask questions, but at the same time, you know, I, I think it's a very, uh, a very progressive way of approaching um, this topic. Well, the, the Round Rock ISD subscribed to this program called Worth the Wait. It was taught uh, out at uh, Scott and White in Temple. And so I went out there for three days uh, to be trained on how to teach the Worth the Wait uh, sex ed program. Right? So it's obviously an abstinence-based program, um, but it was more around the psychological implications and the physical implications. And you know, it was, it was a sound program. Um, but what I didn't know is that for 10 straight days, I would be teaching all eight of my class periods the exact same thing. And I had to recite, like, literally from a script, uh, this program. Um, so naturally, kind of an uncomfortable environment for me. This was not what I had gotten into teaching for. <laughs> I laid out my whole vision, grand plan for being a teacher. This was not it. Um, but I figured that I was going to be creative, right? I was going to make the best of this uh, scenario. And my first thing that I realized the first day in is that no one was asking questions. Um, at all. I mean, no one would look each other in the eyes. Everyone was just head down. No one wanted to talk about anything. And so I had this grand plan that I was going to put a box, shoe box, right? I'd cut a slit in the top of it and kind of wrapped it up. And it was the anonymous question box, right? So you drop your questions in there. Uh, and then I promised my students 
which turned out to be a terrible, terrible promise. But I promised my students that I would answer every question that they put in this box. Uh, and they were completely anonymous, and, and I was going to do this. Um, so the first day ends, you know, I was, I was just glad to have all of my class periods over with. Um, and I opened the box, and sure enough, there's six questions in there, six pieces of paper. I'm like, wow, so this, this whole thing, you know, I was patting myself on the back, this thing is great. And then I start reading through the questions. Not a one of them had anything to do with our curriculum. All of them had to do with my own personal sex life. Um, so I immediately, uh, this was where the beginning of this mantra that I speak to all of our employees, uh, is this a sustainable model? I ask that question all the time. This was the beginning of when I realized the importance of identifying what works and what doesn't work. And then, you know, in, in, the, in the world of entrepreneurship, you can call it a pivot, you can call it whatever you want to call, but it is literally realizing this is not working the way that it should be working, and then you move another direction, okay? So there's story number one. Story number two, um, when the brewery opened, we were very small, right? We were uh, two people deep. I had myself and one employee. Um, I had hired him from a, a company that actually manufactured brewing equipment. Uh, so he had an incredible amount of knowledge on how to build equipment, how to service equipment, how to um, you know, really troubleshoot, but had no brewing knowledge at all, which was fine because that's where my, my expertise came in. I was a biology student um, and, and just loved, loved all aspects of fermentation. Um, so there were two of us that were working for Hops and Grain. Uh, we brewed our first batch of beer. Um, everything was just really turning out great. We had decided, the state of Texas, uh, in all of its infinite wisdom, uh, gives breweries the ability to self-distribute your product up to a certain amount, right? So a small brewery can actually hand deliver all of their product directly to retail stores, grocery stores, bars, restaurants, all of that, uh, up to a certain point. And then once you get big enough, and that limit is basically defined by distributors as when they're actually going to give you the time of day, then you have to work with a distributor. Um, and so for us, we were like, yeah, we'll take advantage of that. It's a great way to shake hands with every bar manager, every, you know, every beer that we are selling, we physically get to like hand it off to this person, uh, check it on the tap. It's this romantic thing of, you know, um, turns out self-distribution is in no way romantic at all. Uh, and I realized this back to that whole sustainable model piece. Um, I realized this the very first day that we were delivering beer. Um, I'm sure most of you have either heard of or been to the Draft House up on Medical Parkway in, uh, in 42nd. Uh, fantastic place. What most people have never seen is the underbelly of their cold room, where all of those kegs of beer that service all, whatever, 90 of those taps, where they actually live. Because uh, it's a pretty small, dark, little, dank English pub, right? And it, for all intents and purposes, you're at the bar and you think it just ends right at the bar. It does not. Underneath the ground is where all of these kegs are housed. And to get to that underground cellar is this very narrow set of stairs that probably is wide enough for one keg of beer to fit down and not another human. Um, and that's it. And it's 25 steps, I get, guess, to get down there. And then once you get down there, then you've got this just forest of kegs that are all on tap, and you've got to figure out where yours goes. And anyway, so this first day, I am one. I just opened the door to the, you know, the staircase of death is what I kind of had viewed it as. One, how am I going to get this keg down there? Because it's only wide enough for a keg, really. And two, once I get it down there, what the hell am I going to do when I get down there? I don't know where it goes. He told me number like 15, but where is number 15? Um, so I had the genius idea to basically, I went down the stairs first, and then I lifted this keg like one stair at a time, and then I'd walk backwards down the staircase. And I, I made it all the way down. Thankfully for us, they bought four kegs of beer, so I, I got to do this four times in a row. Um, and it took all of like an hour and a half for me to drop all these kegs off downstairs. And of course, you know, you go back up and you get handed a check for your, you know, for your beer and everything was great. Uh, and I went home and I'll never forget sitting there thinking to myself, this is the most ridiculous thing that anyone has ever done. Like it's so romantic to make beer and be in a warehouse and overalls and be bearded and that whole thing. You know, your steam coming out of the vent stacks and you're dumping hops in a kettle. Well, no one told me that that was what really the guts of selling beer actually is. Um, so that's kind of story number two on this is not a sustainable model. Um, so from there you figure out what, what do you do next. You figure out how to, one, look at what you've got 
in the immediate right in front of you, what are you going to do with that? Where are you going to go from this? When you realize, like, wow, this is not going to work. There's no way I'm going to do this over and over and over every single day. Where do I go from here? Um, and that's what, you know, I, I try to think about every single day because we look at projections. We look at financials. We look at all of our economic metrics. We track IRI scan data at grocery stores to see what styles are selling the best. We pull Nielsen data all the time. And all those things give us a fantastic roadmap, right, for where we're going to go. But none of those tell us how to deal with the present, how to deal with the immediate and where you are right now. Um, and so from there is kind of where um, I'd like to go into the, the next kind of piece of this. Um, so, you know, the teacher and the brewer, I still view myself very much as a teacher. Uh, very much as a brewer, um, and every single piece of what we do uh, is stressful. If you've ever taught anyone, you know that stress of a new curriculum or a new lesson or a, a, a new topic that you want to present, and you hope your kids get it. You hope they understand, you hope they're engaged, you hope they really want to be a part of that. You're not nervous about presenting, you're nervous about the response and the reaction and what you're going to get out of them. With beer, we spend all of our time formulating new recipes, trying to come up with new things that are exciting, right? And the whole time we're stressed about, are people actually going to drink this? If I make 2,000 gallons of this, is it going to be sold? Are people actually going to pay attention to that? Are they going to drink it? Um, are we relevant, right? That's the ultimate question. Um, and if we are relevant, how do we stay relevant? Um, and so, you know, the big title of my talk is Sustainability Beyond the Environment. Um, something that we do as a brewery is we commit ourselves to being a better environmental steward. Um, we ensure that the packaging materials that we use are the most environmentally friendly out there. Uh, it's why we package in aluminum. Not because it's more efficient to create aluminum, because that in no way is more efficient than creating glass. But when you go outside, when you go down, say, to the Green Belt, or you go to a river, and you're drinking beer, right, which some people do. I don't, I don't know many of them, but some people like to go outside and drink beer, right, on the water. Um, when you do that and you've got 12 cans or you've got 12 bottles, say you and your friends drink all of that, and there's no recycle bin in sight, you know where it is, it's up at the trailhead, right, a mile away, how likely are you to take all 12 of those empty glass bottles versus all 12 of those empty aluminum cans? To us, the answer was aluminum cans. They're lighter, you can crush them down, they're easy. So our goal was to try to provide our customers with an easier way to consume our product and still be environmentally friendly and sustainable. Um, glass is so much easier to create, but once it's created, it's up to us to actually get it back to a recycle bin. And so where are we more likely in that capacity to actually recycle? And you can apply this to any product under the sun um, because all those products get consumed and there's waste involved in some form or fashion. Where is that waste going? And are you even paying attention to where that waste is going? Um, and the reason why that's important is not just because it's better for the environment, but it frames the story that all of your team and all of your employees get to tell. And that's what makes working for a company that cares and has a purpose, that's what makes it exciting, in my opinion. Um, so, you'll never one up humility. This is one of, in my opinion, I, I heard it said in the previous presentation, but this is a character trait that will never ever be topped. This is, in my opinion, the number one thing that as an entrepreneur, you have to embrace. Because as much as we think we know everything and as smart as we think we are and as just, you know, we, we are the greatest thing that's ever graced the planet when we come up with these crazy ideas, there's always someone that knows more. And the beauty is that you can most likely hire that person if you can do it right. Um, and if you can be humble enough and you can own up to yourself that there are people that know how to do the things that you need done better than you, that's how you become a legendary company, in my opinion. Um, hire smarter than yourself. It's one of the hardest things to convince a manager in any company because hiring someone smarter than yourself means putting your own job at risk, right? Well, we're in a very beautiful position as founders to not necessarily have to worry about that, right? And the reason why people are so hesitant to do that blows my mind. But there are some incredibly talented people out there that just want to have trust from their employer. 
They want to have a purpose. They want to have a reason to do what they're doing, and they want their managers to leave them the hell alone because they know how to do what they're doing. And that is one of the hardest things, especially as a 35-year-old. Uh, that's difficult because my brain is constantly moving with ideas. Um, and I want to make sure those ideas are exactly what I envisioned them to be. And especially in beer. Beer is such a scientific, artistic process. And to think, if I hand this over to somebody, they're probably not going to do it as well as I could do it. Well, guess what? They're probably not going to do it the same way that you would do it. But that doesn't mean that it's not as good as you would do it. Um, and so owning up to that is the greatest thing ever. Um, the second piece of that is getting your hands dirty. There's this mindset of, well, once you grow to a certain point, you hire someone to take that on, then you never have to deal with that again, right? Well, you're never going to rally a team behind you if you can't show them that you know how to do all of those things. Um, it's important. It's important for you personally, back to that humility thing. It's also important for your team to know that you actually know what they're doing. Um, no one wants to have a conversation with someone that has no idea what it is they do on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, you want to make someone feel completely unwanted? Do that. Have no idea what it is that they do. Um, so proving to your team that you know what's going on involves you being able to do the things that everyone in your company does. You don't need to do them better than everyone else, but you need to know how they work. Because how else are you going to innovate? How else are you going to grow if you don't actually know how your company works? and the inner workings of your company. And if you need to hire great people, but you don't know what task you're trying to hire them for, how are you gonna hire great people? Great people wanna be challenged. And if you don't know what you're doing, you don't know how to challenge them. Um, and that, that makes a great team. Um, and so to me, I love being, I, I used to joke about this, I was never a great athlete. I was, uh, I was always like an 80% athlete. Right? I could compete with like 80%, but I could never get above that. Um, but I also really loved sports, and every single sport. I was never great at any one, but I was always good enough to like, do a pickup game with anyone. Um, and I think that's one of the greatest traits you can have as an entrepreneur, is knowing a little bit about everything. Right? You've got a vision that no one else can replicate, and you have a plan and you have a mind that likely in your company does not, there's not another one like you. But if you know just enough about every single thing that's going on in your company because you were a part of it when it started, you will create a team that is, in my opinion, unparalleled. Um, and they'll respect you because if they need to go out of town and no one else wants to fill in for them and you as the founder can jump in and take care of that while they're out of town or while they have an emergency, man, you have got someone for life. Uh, and the generation that we're all hiring um, is a generation that, one, does not care about how much money they make. That has never been a piece of the equation when you're hiring someone between the ages of 22 and 35. Um, the value that you provide to them is a purpose for their work. We all need our own outside of work careers and hobbies and things, be it running, be it playing golf, be it gardening, whatever that is. We all have those things. But we spend the bulk of our time sleeping and working. You're not going to change anything sleeping. <laughs> you have no influence on that necessarily. But when your employees come to you to work, and they want to be a part of something that they can believe in, and they want to be a part of something that has a purpose, it is 100% on your shoulders to provide that purpose. And a lot of that, in my opinion, requires you to hand off things. Because the purpose you built, and you know the inner workings of that purpose, but you can't keep doing all of them. Um, because one, you're going to get run over by everybody else. You're never going to be able to continue to grow and innovate. And two, you're missing out on so much creativity and so much talent that if you can't step out of yourself and you can't, be, can't carry on humility enough to say, man, I got some really talented people. And I need to, one, put them in positions to grow, and then I need to tell them how great they're doing. And I need to tell everybody else how great they're doing. Um, because all of us want positive reinforcement. Um, and if you want to rally a team that actually stays around, um, you know, how do you retain people? Um, that's the future. Um, and so I, I joke a lot with our team about um, are you living the purpose or the porpoise, right? Because think about a porpoise and there's, what is it, there's dolphins, there's whales, they're, you know, they're all a porpoise, but they all have their own specific uh, ways of operating, right? A purpose should not. If your company has a purpose, it should be very clearly defined. It shouldn't be muddied. It shouldn't be something that people can't understand. It needs to be five, seven words, maybe, at most. Um, but the story behind that purpose is where you spend your time. 
And that's where you train your people around. Uh, because like I said, we make beer, and beer is easy, right? Beer is, beer is just beer. Uh, it's super complex, and a lot of people like to talk about the aromas and the body and the, these things and whatever. And I'm going to tell you right now, as a person that makes beer every single day, um, I will go as deep and dorked out on beer as you want to, but at the end of the day, I'd rather sit down and talk about what else is going on uh, and use beer as the catalyst for that conversation. Uh, and that's why I decided to make beer. But the product is not everything. The product is a way for you to rally a team, it's a way for you to tell your story, and it's a way to, to motivate. Uh, because without motivation, you know, the, the world cannot be all entrepreneurs. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, I, I joke a lot, I don't know if you've ever, if you're in, any Wes Anderson fans in the room. Um, so one, if one of my favorite movies is Bottle Rocket, right? Um, Bottle Rocket is probably one of the Wes Anderson films that less people have seen, but there's a scene in there where um, Owen Wilson is, <laughs> he works for a company called the Lawn Wranglers, right? They're a landscaping company. But this landscaping company doubles for uh, this like theft outfit. So they go in and they case houses when they're doing the landscaping and then they end up breaking into the houses and stealing stuff, blah, blah, blah. So Owen Wilson works for this company, right? Um, and his big grand vision is like he wants to be like the ringleader of the, the actual, like the legal stuff going on. He doesn't want to just, you know, mow the grass and trim the hedges and do all that stuff. But um, there's this really pivotal point where he's, he's so excited about this new you know, house that they're going to start casing, and his boss uh, looks at him and he says, just because it's a front for an operation doesn't mean someone doesn't still need to cut the grass. And that's like such a classic line from Wes Anderson. And Wes Anderson, I think he's one of the most genius uh, um, just creators of our time. But that's such a great line that we're all part of this bigger thing, right? Any company has got to have a long-term vision and a long-term goal. But we, we can't all be the visionaries thinking about the long-term goal. Like, at the end of the day, we still have to do the work, right? We still have to be, day in and day out, living for this product. And if that product doesn't have purpose, how are you ever going to get anybody to do just the day-to-day? -day? Um, and so, you know, to me, that's a big thing. Don't just celebrate successes. Everybody needs to be a part of failures. They don't need to be punished for failures, but they need to be a part of it. They need to know why you failed, and then they need to be able to provide feedback on how to do that better. Um, because again, if you're part of a team and you're part of a purpose, then you need to value everyone's input, be it successful input or here's why we didn't do this so well. Um, be willing to lose money. This is a tough one. <laughs> um, believe me, our industry is very interesting in the way that we just dump money into projects. Um, our equipment that we have to purchase, we have to buy it seven to eight months before we actually receive it. Right? There are not enough people manufacturing stainless steel, sanitary brewing equipment to keep up. So there's lead times on all this stuff, but they're in this fantastic position of taking 85% of the total cost of the equipment up front to actually start fabricating it. Uh, we put beer in oak barrels and let it sit for 12, 24, 36 months. Uh, to create these wild flavors that we, we don't even know if it's going to happen, but we have this vision that it's going to happen. Meanwhile, all that beer could have been sold two weeks later. Um, we spend a lot of money just trying to be cool. <laughs> I'll just lay it out like that. Uh, people love craft beer, uh, and we unfortunately um, continue to think that just by dumping money into stuff, we're going to continue to be relevant and cool. Uh, and a lot of times it works. But what I mean by be willing to lose money is be willing to put faith in employees that you have to try something out that you have no idea if it's going to work or not. And do not hold them accountable if it doesn't work. Um, because without that ability to really try and do something great, no one's ever going to do anything great. And you have to have, if you don't have enough money to let someone try out a small project that's ultimately going to make them one of the leaders of your company, then you didn't think it out properly to begin with. Um, I'm not talking about dumping $15 million into you know, some research project and just giving someone the complete you know, free reign, but little things. Find out why people tick, what they like being, what they want to do with the industry that they're in, and let them play around. Lose some money. Have that in your budget. Um, call it marketing. Call it advertising. Call it R&D. You know? um, like call it mad money. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, and if you're lucky, you're in an industry like beer where we have all kinds of uh, R&D tax credits um, for all of our experiments. Um, and so, um, but really, you know, that, that, is, that is important. Um, and it's so important, in my opinion, to communicate that to your employees, that 
We are very fiscally responsible, but if you have a hunch and you want to run with it, let's do it. And I'm going to back you on that. And I'm going to be there to coach you, and we're going to be there to succeed, and we're going to celebrate it all together. But if we lose money and it doesn't work, we learned a lot, and we're going to figure out what we do next from there. Um, and then that I kind of finished with, uh, with transparency is so hot right now. Uh, everybody wants to know your financials. Your employees, believe it or not, man, they want to know how much money you made. They want to know how much your cost of goods were. They want to know your expenses. They want to know all that stuff because they're hungry for information. And I don't see any reason why you shouldn't disclose that to all of them. Um, I don't think that you should tell all of them what their coworkers' salaries are or you know components like that. But being able to look at your team as a way to be more efficient, and if all of them have their eyes on efficiency, your company is going to be more efficient. And so if you can talk to them on, here's where our gross profit margins were this quarter. And we think if we can be more efficient with inventory management, and we can keep our malt orders where they need to be, we'll be able to drop that or raise that, you know, depending on what metric you're looking at, 2 to 3%. And what that translates to you is that we have more money to innovate. And ultimately, we have more money to pay our employees. Um, and what we do at Hops and Grain is we tie all of our employees' production bonuses to those metrics. Um, if you can make our cost of goods lower for the same output and the same quality and the same specifications, that money goes to our employees. It doesn't go just straight into our company. I pay that out to them because they're the only reason why we did that. It's not because I had the idea. Uh, you still need people to do that. It's back to that, you know, just because it's a front for an operation doesn't mean we still got to cut the grass, right? Um, so that transparency is huge. And I, I've found it at least, um, you know, in, in my time in the beer industry to be huge. Um, our employees go out and they talk about our successes. They talk about our percentage increase on depletions with our wholesalers. They talk about how many barrels we're making. They talk about our sales. They talk about our taproom sales. And it becomes this really fun, competitive nature amongst our industry. Um, you know, technology is a little different than beer. <laughs> We're a little more collegial in, uh, you know, in sharing information. But when it comes down to it, when there's tap handles available or there's shelf space available, it is a cutthroat competition. Uh, and we love to talk about whose tap handles we stole and what new shelf space we got and how many HEBs we just launched. And those things are fun. And when you empower your team and you present them that information, um, they're all going to be spokespeople uh, out in the market. Whereas normally they may just be going to the grocery store. If they know that, they're going to the grocery store and they're talking to everybody that comes up and they're like, hey, have you tried uh, this beer here? And, you know, um, and that's awesome. It provides them with a reason you know, to have a lot of fun at the grocery store rather than just grocery shopping. Uh, it helps them develop relationships with new people. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it makes your, best, your business more successful because it, it drives more people to you. Um, so. The exit strategy, right? We talk about this a lot. Everybody talks about, this was the question that I got from most of our investors when I was uh, fundraising was, well, what's your exit strategy? Um, and I used to just tell them straight up, like, my, I do not plan to exit what I'm creating. Uh, am I going to be doing the same thing that I'm doing with hops and grain brewing 10 years from now? Probably not. But I got into this for a very, very specific purpose, and it's because I, I believe very purely in the product that we produce. Uh, I think that product can catapult into 5,000 different things. We make dog treats at our brewery from our spent brewing grains. Yes, we take our spent brewing grain and we turn it into dog treats. Uh, we roast coffee on site. We serve coffee on site. All those things are underneath the umbrella of hops and grain brewing. Um, and everyone knows them all as hops and grain brewing. But I got into this industry because I absolutely believe in it. And I think it's a fantastic thing. Um, and so that's... That's framed my viewpoint of an exit strategy completely different, I think, uh, than most startups view it as. It's, I'm going to open the business, I'm going to grow it to this point, and then I'm going to sell it, right? Um, will I ever sell hops and grain? Absolutely. You know, that's never been, I, I didn't plan to open a brewery and just like sit on, I have no kids. My wife and I don't have plans for having kids. I don't have anyone to hand this off to other than my team. Um, and so my exit strategy my sale, my acquisition, is going to involve my employees because they're the best people to carry this thing out beyond me, uh, which has always been my goal. Everything that I've put my heart into, every brand that I'm a part of creating, I want to outlive me. 
I don't want it to be consumed and just squashed. And in our industry, unlike a lot of technologies, beer is consumed by the macro brewers, Anheuser-Busch InBev, Sab Miller. Their goal is not necessarily to continue to pump more resources, resources into a very inefficient operation. Uh, their intent is to do, if any of you were here in the 90s, with Celis Brewery. Very, very famous brewmaster, came over from Belgium, uh, Hogarten, started a brewery here, created Celis White. It's one of the most popular beers in the country, uh, right here in Austin, Texas. Literally the very first, I mean, Shiner had been around, but they were kind of the first true like craft brewery here. Um, Pierre Celis, the founder, wanted to bring his family over from Belgium. Um, he didn't have the money at the time, but Miller had been courting him to buy his brand because, you know, it was taking market share away from uh, the Miller brand. And so they said, hey, we'll pay you, I think at the time, this is like 93, they paid him $22 million, which is pretty incredible for a brewery in the early 90s. Uh, two years later, they just closed it down. They have the money to do that because the market share they were losing from Celis was much much, much, much more valuable than the $22 million they spent on it and shut it down. So when you look at acquisitions and you look at mergers and you look at strategic partners and you look at even, you know, VC private equity funds, the important thing, I believe, uh, one, is to know what, what is your plan? What did you want with this whole thing? Did you start it to make money? Did you start it to change the world? Did you start it to impact other people? Did you start it just to be a place that you didn't have to work for somebody else? And you have to view your exit strategy under whatever that intent was. Uh, because I loved hearing that, like, yeah, I mean, how much money can you ultimately spend? <laughs> you know, you made 10 million or 7 million. Like, really? Is it that, is that that big of a deal? Can you go to sleep at night after that sale knowing that this thing that you created is something that you're still proud of? Well, in Pebble Beach, you know, the difference between 7 and 10 million for a home, just you know, down the block, you might <laughs> <have been laughs> that home. Right, right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's so important to me that you know, we, we all have to have an exit in mind. You can. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm sure I probably yeah. Just say I could build a pretty rad brewery, I think, for uh, for all that money. But I was getting, getting back to that. You had to get investors in order to create this. Sure. Have you paid them back? I mean, how, how would how would you do that? Could you just pay them back and then keep it and then sell it to your, your people or how did, how is that going Well, I mean, it, it, it ultimately depends on how you kind of structure your entity. So our, ours was, you know, we sold equity uh, to raise the money that we needed to start the brewery. Um, how much? I mean, just is it proprietary? I mean, which is a lot of millions of dollars or? I mean, oh, no, 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 no. We started with $750,000. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, that's pretty and which was, you know, bootstrapped for a brewery, but, um, but my bigger interest was in really the, the proof of concept. You know, I, I didn't want to put millions into a facility that I had no idea people were really going to, you know, because, uh, again, there were two breweries in Austin uh, when we decided to do this. And so, you know, my pitch to all of our investors was, was absolutely, like, we're going to grow this brand. We're going to add value to it. We're going to continue to expand. We're going to go into every market that we can and still maintain the integrity of our product. Um, and when that value comes, our industry has been so dynamic over the past 10 years. Um, Private equity was not even a thing that was paying any attention to the beer industry four years ago. Um, when, when I opened, you know, starting in 2009, we approached a couple of banks, and they didn't even know what a brewery was in the scale that we were trying to open it in. It's like, no, no way is that anything that we would even entertain lending to. Um, not only was, you know, 2009 probably not the best time <laughs> to try to raise money for a really risky industry, but no one knew what it was. And now you've got valuation. So Ballast Point, a brewery that um, based out of San Diego, right? They make uh, Sculpin IPA. They make a couple of brands that are really popular. I think they distribute in 32 states right now. Um, last year, they or 2014, they had 50 million dollars in revenue, top line revenue. Constellation Brands, which is a huge importer, they do um, all kinds of wine, spirits. They sell Corona. Um, they bought Ballast Point for a billion dollars. That is an absurd valuation um, with $50 million in revenue in a product like beer that doesn't really have, I mean, you're just going to make beer and continue to make beer. There's not really anything that you're going to catapult off of or, or go off that has a higher profit margin or any of that stuff. 
But for a company like Constellation to pay a billion dollars for a craft brewery, that was it. They thought the brand was relevant. And they have the economies of scale to distribute overseas and to ship it all over the place. And so they saw the value in the brand itself. Um, but that's unheard of. I mean, there's, no, there's been no history for that in beer. Um, and so when I was pitching to our investors, it was, I have no idea where this whole thing is going to be in five years from now. But everything that we make is going to be reinvested in our growth. Uh, because that's the only way we're going to be able to stay relevant uh, in an industry that at the time was completely choked by Anheuser-Busch uh, Miller there's, Coors. There's no saturation. I mean, I, I kind of wonder, once you have other breweries and there's a lot of competition and you're, there's, there's only so many bars, so you have to sell out of the community. Of the well, you do or you, or you have to get creative. And that goes back to, you know, to viewing your business as what's happening in the present. Because the way I see it, millennials are our number one consumer. They're buying more beer than any other, <laughs> any other age segment out there. All of them grew up yeah. in college with every bar that they went to had at least a craft beer on tap, if not 20 of them, if you grew up in a place like Austin. Sure. When I was in college, that was not a thing. It was cheap beer. It was 30 packs of Keystone Light or whatever if you wanted to drink beer. Well, every generation passed. This is not stopping. I mean, every bar is just now starting to really grasp one, the profit margins in selling craft versus selling macro loggers. Uh, and two, everybody wants it. Everybody wants to go out and see that. College students want to talk about, like, I had this new craft beer because it's yeah. cool. Uh, and so every new yeah. crop of students that's coming up, they're getting more and more exposure to craft. Well, guess what they're going to do for the next 25 or 30 years, maybe 40, is drink alcohol. And if that's what they grew up with, it's just the norm. Bud Light is no longer the norm. Miller Light is no longer the norm. There are 117 licensed breweries in the state of Texas and 400 licensed wineries. And not a one winery is closing down. Uh, and so for me, the whole reason why I got into beer was all of these things. It's like, wow, you have this captive audience that very few people in Texas are selling to. Um, they're only going to continue purchasing as they get jobs and have more disposable income. Um, and they're so wildly loyal to a concept of purpose. Um, and so as a business, if you can do that, if you can have purpose, if you can be something that people actually want to be a part of, um, that's where you retain employees, that's where you grow your business, and that's where you really add value um, for your exit, you know, whatever that may look like. Yeah? Uh, so I saw your little profile on Able Lending yeah. and video testimonial you did uh, about 600K. So let me ask you, like, at that point, since you'd already seen some growth, already had a lot of traction, what were you able to do with that infusion of cash at, at that point in the company's trajectory? So we were, when we started working with Abel, um, we were at a point where we had completely, everything that we were making was sold two weeks before we even made it. Uh, and that was just in Austin. You know, and our, our grand goal, ultimately, was we wanted to get our beer into markets outside of the city. Um, and so we had two distributors that we had just signed on uh, that had given us projections, and we were meeting like 10% of what they were ordering. Uh, none of our retail stores were getting actually orders completely fulfilled. Um, and so when we went to Abel and kind of told them what was going on, I mean, it was a no-brainer for them. Um, but all of that went into new equipment, new tanks, uh, new capacity. We put a lot at that point into marketing as well, which to me was kind of a, uh, an important piece to, you can make a beer that has a really fantastic story, but if you don't have the capital and resources to tell the story, it's kind of, you know, it's falling on uh, no ears, I guess. Um, but yeah, that was what we did with Abel. Um, and they're an incredible partner in what they provide from a marketing, from a networking standpoint. They've rented out our tasting room five different times to host networking events, uh, things that, you know, Bank of America would not be doing if we had uh, taken a loan from a more traditional lender. So, um, so this is kind of where it ends. I, I, I wanted to leave uh, leave this last little quote up and then open up for any questions if anyone had them. But um, to conquer oneself is a greater task than conquering others. Um, it's back to that humility. Uh, if you can realize that you're the most complicated thing that needs solving, not everybody else. Um, I think you can be a great leader. I think you can be a great uh, inspirational piece. You can really make an impact on whatever industry it is that you're choosing. Uh, and at the end of the day, you sleep well at night. Uh, 
and you're wealthy, hopefully financially, but uh, more importantly, spiritually. Um, and that's what makes you a great leader. So, any questions? I mean, it must be wonderful to go in, into that aroma every day. I, before you were born, I worked at Paul Masson Winery. Okay. In Solid California. I got to do the. I was a tester and got the, the, the uh, chemist there, and it was just a wonderful experience to go in and smell the, the musk. And it was just, it was great. Oh. I don't know, just the aroma alone. We give tours at our brewery every weekend, and that's one of the funnest things is to watch people's, like, they walk back there, and you can see their noses just, like, moving, like, what are all these smells? And, yeah. Uh, so, so you entered into this with some knowledge of the, or quite a bit of knowledge of, did you study fermentation in college specifically? Not, no, I didn't study fermentation. I was very interested in fermentation, yeah, but. Biology then. Right. Yeah, I have a degree in biology, too, and that's why I pursued yeah. that, but I could understand that. Uh, so you had, you weren't just blind. No, no. I'd never worked in a brewery before, partner, but... There was, you said you start off with someone who had expertise that you didn't, and he had the machine equipment expertise, so just the, the two of you. Right, and he was just, he was an employee, so I, I, I have no partners. So when you got the money, then you required the money, it was based upon the equipment, the expensive equipment and the location facility. So how long was it until you actually made a profit or you could, I mean, it paid for itself? When was the, uh, the point at which... You, sustainable right so we were we were profitable six months in um, the thing about beer is that the way that you grow revenue is by adding more equipment you know we you can only make so much product with the equipment that you have and so it's a wildly capital intensive uh, operation you don't just make something that you can then just sell to everyone without actually having to turn the product that liquid form into something else so we from that point we just started reinvesting everything um, and given the, the lead times for equipment like that, you go through these weird ups and downs of we're profitable and then we just dumped all of our money into something that we're waiting six months on. Uh, so we're really cash poor. We're still kind of turning a profit, but we have no available cash. So we can't really hire anybody else. And then all of a sudden the equipment shows up and then you're back up on this again. And then you're out of beer all in the market and then you got to invest a bunch more. Um, so we're just now, you know, four and a half years later, we're finally at a point where we've filled up the capacity that our facility uh, can handle. Um, we're reaching, you know, a few new markets, and we're about to open another facility. Um, so we're about to go right back into. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah, but our whole our whole goal is we're building value because we we are very much looking long term at bringing in a partner that is going to you know acquire you know a majority, if not all, of the brewery and be able to provide the capital and the access to debt that we currently don't have uh, to really be able to grow in, in efficiencies and economies of scale. Yeah, I wasn't sure if, if you could achieve that on your own. This was because we had the bootstrapping before. I thought it may come a time. I'm, I'm looking to create a product that we can get sustainable, but then we could, we could reinvest to a point where we could, or we could go to a bank. Let's say we have a certain revenue rather than got investors. So if you go to investors, then they're going to want equity. So, you know, where banks, you, get money, but you, they, no one takes your equity. I just wanted you, you could build it yourself. Is that something? Well, I, I never really looked at it. I mean, my goal wasn't, you know, kind of back on to my exit strategy plan. My goal was never to have 100% ownership in the company so that whenever I did sell, I would be able to maximize, you know, yeah. um, was, that return. So I, it was never an, an, okay. an interest. I wanted to have control. That was always my big right. thing. And I, it, anyone who has a vision and a product or something they want to launch, maintain control. You don't have to maintain the majority of equity, know, but, 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 but see, have control. I, I, I'm curious, because once you take on investors, whether they're a majority or not, it seems like the, the contracts can be written that they still, they're majority owners anyway when they exit, or they, they and it's not- Well, when they exit, the money, sure. It's about the control itself. Once you relinquish that, I, I feel much more comfortable having a bank loan. Let's say I'm, I'm a sustainable point, and I get a bank loan to get more money. It's just, it's money, but it's not, of the, of the direction that you want. But well, they have a lot of control. I mean, if you don't, <laughs> if you can't pay your loan, they've, they've probably got everything that you have. So it's, yeah, to me, it's as much control as an investor that's a, you know, either minority or silent partner. Um, but yeah, maintain control. That's important, obviously. You, wanna, you want your, your vision and your, you know, ideals to be carried out. But I wouldn't view debt as uh, necessarily a better option to equity. Because you have to pay that note back every single month, whereas when you bring on equity partners, 
Um, you don't necessarily have an obligation every single month to pay them something. But I was concerned, I guess, with your, the other discussions about equity partner, partners that, you know, there will come a time when, well, if it's not up to the point, and I've seen companies liquidated. We say, well, we're, we're not going to wait any longer. We're going to liquidate and you lose hundreds of all. But if you're, it's just, I'm not going to disagree. It's just, just different circumstances. Sure, so sure. And it, yeah, and every industry is a little bit different, you know, for sure. I really appreciate it. You ever made any uh, Egyptian, ancient Egyptian beer, taking the, I guess the uh, the yeast from they found some in the in the tomb. <laughs> Dog Dogfish Head up in yeah, Delaware that, created you know, a. We have civilization. It was a way. Of, the water true. Was part it was. Of the dirt, yeah, it was. It was a way to have safe, uh, safe wine. drinking liquid. Yeah. Without wine and beer. Hey, thanks for coming. Thank Absolutely. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Guys, thank you again.